Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 199. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. Michael Jordan. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by taylorsound.com. One of the most complicated problems I've had in my professional career is sound and sound mixing, sound design is generally always very expensive. But Taylor Sound has come onto the scene and has done something pretty incredible. Like so many other things you have in the world today, now you can get your sound design online. They're offering flat promotional rates for commercials, music videos, short films, and any other video content that's short form. They're very affordable, and because you are an Indie Film Hustle Tribe member, will get 15% off your order. Just type in the word hustle in the post your brief section. That's T-A-I-L-O-R sound.com. So today on the show, we have a returning guest. His name is Joshua Caldwell. Now, His first episode, which was episode 121, is one of the most popular podcast episodes in the history of Indie Film Hustle, and I wanted to bring him back because that episode was called The Art of the $6,000 Feature Film, and he made an amazing film called The Layover for $6,000, and he really laid out how he did it and really was transparent in his entire process. But, you know, I have a lot of times I have filmmakers and, uh, you know, you hear stories of these filmmakers making a movie for six grand or five grand or ten grand. But you never hear the story about what happens afterwards. What do you do after you make that six thousand dollar movie? Well, today we have an opportunity to see what happened. Joshua then went on to make a hundred thousand dollar movie. So we're going to talk about today how he was able to leverage his $6,000 movie and grow to a $100,000 budget film within a year uh, or so of doing his first film and his entire journey doing that. And also now how he was able to bring all the sensibilities and techniques that he did on a $6,000 film and apply that to a $100,000 budget and how much more he was able to get as far as production value and just squeeze more juice out of his budget. So I really wanted to bring him back and uh, and share this very unique perspective on the indie film hustle, if you will. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Joshua Caldwell. I'd like to welcome back to the show, Joshua Caldwell, man. Thanks for coming back, brother. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Your last episode, uh, the the how do uh, what did I call it? The um, the blueprint or the guide to a six thousand dollar feature film or something? Yeah, like? rethinking, something like that. rethinking the six thousand dollar, rethinking the six thousand dollar feature film, which was uh, uh, your film layover, which was I found uh, awesome and and inspiring, and I think a lot of the uh, the tribe did as well. And then uh, now you've got a new movie, and you've kind of just up the game. So you basically took the model of a $6,000 movie and just added a hundred thousand dollars to it, but stayed in the $6,000 spirit. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, that's right. That's so, right. So tell me a little bit about negative and how did it come to be? So negative is a, a spy thriller. It's, it's the story of this, uh, this guy named Hollis who takes a picture of this woman, uh, in downtown LA, thinks nothing of it. goes back to his apartment, uh, develops the film cause he's a 35 millimeter type of guy. And um, next thing you know, this woman is at his door demanding the film, demanding the negative, and um, takes it by force. And before they can escape or before she can leave, uh, men with guns show up, and uh, she's forced to take Hollis with her on the run as you discover that she's basically a former – she's she's now a former British spy who's being chased by the uh, one of the Mexican cartels. And uh, for reasons that become clear in the film. And um, so it was this just kind of really fun – you know, spy thriller road movie, um, that I'd wanted to make. And, and it was, so it was born out of this idea I had in college, which was, um, you know, I was going to make, I wanted to make a short about a guy who goes into central park. He takes a bunch of pictures with his, you know, uh, a, a still a 35 millimeter camera mm-hmm. and, um, goes and gets them at the one hour develop, you know, one hour photo development and, uh, takes them out and he finds a photo. 
You're dating yourself. <laughs> I know. Totally. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, which is weird because I don't feel that old. But, I know. Me, uh, yeah. Same here. It's, it's, things have moved very quickly, sir. <laughs> very quickly. And so anyway, so now you know why, like you couldn't make this movie today. But um, anyway, the idea was he finds one of the photos and it's just a photo of this woman like staring at him. Mm-hmm. Like through the through the picture. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. No idea where it goes. Mm-hmm. Never could figure it out. And, um, you know, a couple years ago, I met this young writer, Adam Gaines, who um, he reached out to me about being on a podcast I was doing to talk about this like book that he was writing. And I read some of his stuff and I really, really liked it. And he had just a, such a great ear for dialogue. I mean, he had a real like Sorkin-esque quality to, to mm-hmm. his writing. Mm-hmm. And... I said, we should do something together. And a couple of months passed, a couple, you know, didn't find anything. But basically I was like, you know, I've got this random idea. It's the story of this guy who takes a picture of this woman. And I was like, maybe it could be a spy thriller. You know, maybe it could be like, he shouldn't have taken this picture of the woman and shit happens. I don't know what else happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And I go, but it may be cool short. And I've got these two actors, Katia Winter, Simon Quarterman, who I'm attached to do this other movie with. And I was thinking, like, just as an exercise, it'd just be fun to do a short, right? Just to, like, get our, you know, get our feet wet and try something out. Mm -hmm. He said, all right, let me work on it. So he wrote basically the first 10 minutes of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then scheduling didn't work out for whatever reason. But basically, I told him, well, listen, like, if we're going to go to all this effort to make a short, and this was definitely post layover. So it was Mm -hmm. like, if we're going to go to all this effort to make a short, why don't we just make a feature? Like, we already had the actors. Amen. (laughs) And he was like... Okay, sure. So then he went away and started writing, and I went away and did uh, a series for Hulu called South Beach. Mm -hmm. And then I did another movie called uh, Be Somebody for Studio 71 in Paramount. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he came back with a script, and then we basically – I was like, all right, um, let's make this our next movie. But I want to do it in a very specific way, Mm -hmm. and I want to do it for very little money. Very cool. And now how did you get the money? Because it's a $100,000 budget. Yeah. So it was, um, it basically, I went to a company called Mar Vista mm-hmm. who are known for doing, um, I mean, their bread and butter is doing lifetime movies, but they've re- really started putting their attention and focus on doing some of these under million dollar, really different, you know, exciting, unique, uh, edgy type of films. Mm-hmm. And I had a relationship over there because of layover and mm-hmm. they were interested in doing something with me and we was ha- having trouble finding the right thing. And I came in with negative and they were like, we don't know. And I said, well, I only want a hundred thousand dollars to do it. And they were like, Oh, okay, well we could probably do that. And I said, (laughs) but the caveat is that I kind of, I would like you to leave me alone and I want to go away and make this from a production standpoint in a, in a very specific way. I don't want to, I don't want to be dictated to in terms of how I set up the production of this. Mm -hmm. I said, that's fine. Just come back to us with a movie. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's what we did. And this was born out of, this was born out of the other two projects I had done. And what had happened was in making layover, because we were lighting very little using natural light. Um, we were a very small crew. There was like just a ton of freedom and there was a ton of time, right? We'd show up to location. We'd put a China ball up. We'd start shooting. We'd shoot for eight hours. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't light be lighting for four hours and shooting for four. We we'd shoot for four hours or eight hours. And we would just get a lot of takes and a lot of material. We got to Mm -hmm. try things and discover things. And it was just a really great way to make a film. And then I went and did these two other projects, which um, had much bigger budgets. I mean, you know, 150 times the budget of, of Leo. <laughs> right. And yet I feel I felt significantly more constricted because I was I was told, well, you only have, you know, in the case of, of the Hulu series, I only had 15 days to shoot 150 pages of material. Mm-hmm. In the case of the other movie, I had 12 days to shoot an 80 page script. Mm hmm. And so you have, you know, what happens is um, when you started getting into these under million dollar, million dollar, one point five million dollar scenarios, what everyone is doing is they're taking the sort of traditional production model that they know and love that that you have on a ten million dollar movie and they're scaling it down to your million dollar movie. But what happens is what what you don't lose are the trailers. What you don't lose are the crew. What you don't lose are the equipment and the all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. What you lose are your shooting days. Mm-hmm. And your shooting days and time is everything in making a movie as we, as we know. Mm-hmm. And I just realized very quickly that when we were spending so long lighting, so long moving, so long going from place to place, trying to do so much in one day, that it just wasn't conducive to getting really, really great material. Mm-hmm. You know, you just feel like you're a bit in a factory, and you're doing the best you can, 
and you're working within those constraints, which can be eye opening and, and a learning, you know, learning experience for sure. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And people are certainly capable of it. You hear all the stories about, oh, I shot my movie in 10 days. It's like, yeah. that's great. You know, and people can do that. I really struggle with it because I really like having time with the actors and to get the best that we can get. And I'm not yet in a position of working with, you know, those actors that can come in. I mean, Katya and Simon are different, but like, you know, prior to negative, it was sort of like, you know, some some people struggled with like only having three takes. You needed more time with them mm-hmm. just to get great stuff. And it's not their fault. Like it's nothing wrong with them. Mm-hmm. You just, you really wanted to spend time playing mm-hmm. and trying things and letting them explore it instead of being like, you just got to say these lines and you got to do it a couple different times and we got to go. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I, I felt like I was betraying them, the actors in sure. a way. Sure. And, um, I just didn't feel great about the work that I had done. And so when I came to doing negative, I was very specific in saying, we're going to do this a very different way. And I'm going to, I'm going to take away the things that I don't think we're going to need. I'm going to take away the crew. I'm going to take away the trailers. I'm going to take away all the trucks full of equipment. I'm going to take away all this stuff. And instead I'm going to give us time. So in the case of negative, Mm -hmm. we're only a hundred thousand dollars, by the way, that, that includes posts. So Mm -hmm. it was about a $75,000 production budget. Mm -hmm. We shot for 38 days. Over six months. Over six months. How did that work? So like, did you just like on weekends? I mean, how did you do it? So we just, um, we just sort of did it when we had the time. Like it wasn't so much we had the time because we had a deadline when we had to deliver the movie. But mm-hmm. we basically, so prior in the fall of 2015, we started shooting. We started shooting. We hadn't yet gotten the money. We hadn't closed the deal with Mar Vista. But I was like, we got to start because mm-hmm. I have this other thing I got to do. So like I'm going to start shooting all the things that aren't going to cost us anything. So I'm going to shoot the opening chase scene where we're downtown LA and we don't have permits and we don't have all this stuff. I'm going to do all the stuff that I know isn't going to cost us any money to do, or is going to cost us so little that I can like gap finance it. Mm. Um, so we did like, you know, we'd go, okay, let's do a couple days stretch and then we'll take a break. And then mm-hmm. we'll do a couple days stretch, take a break. Mm-hmm. And then in January we came back and we did like all the motel stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and then we took a break and then we did all the, and then in, we, so we'd sort of like, we do these like week long production gaps or mm-hmm. production schedules. Mm-hmm. And then in between we'd pick off days here mm-hmm. and there. Mm-hmm. So like we'd go up and do a lot of the driving stuff, which driving takes forever. If you're trying to do it on a, on a really tight schedule, it's mm-hmm. just like, it takes time. So it's like, Oh, we'll just do that on those days. when We don't have anything else to do. And it was basically like the, you know, our crew was uh, essentially myself, our, our producer, Will, um, Borthwick, the two actors, and a sound guy for the most part. And that was it. Um, if we were shooting nighttime or we were doing sort of sort of bigger scenes, we'd, we'd scale up and we'd bring on a gaffer. Or we'd bring on, you know, um, uh, makeup or something like that. But for the most part, we kept the crew really light. So like all the people going out, I mean, we weren't really paying ourselves. So like everyone going out was basically we paid a sound guy. And that was our that was our cost for the day. Because you, you, like, you own the gear already. You own the gear. The car was mine. The actors, you know, we already bought the wardrobe. So like we weren't renting it. And so a lot of those days were like hundred dollar days, you know, or $200 days. And then we do the other stuff where we're going out and getting a house in Palm Springs and Airbnb it and, you know, and yeah, then you the, scale up and those are the $5,000. So that, that, so that was another question I wanted to ask you about Airbnb. Do you actually just Airbnb a house and then just go shoot? We did. But in this case, we, uh, we did get permission from okay. the owner. Now, do you, um, and, and you, have you done that before? You just Airbnb and then just shoot? Yes. <laughs> and now what's the what's the issue if you do that uh, from a, a distribution issue? Because all of a sudden you Airbnb a house, you shoot it, and then you know a year later the owner sees his house on a movie. Is that a problem? Is that an it's, issue? It, it can be. I would suggest talking to a lawyer about it. Mm-hmm. Um, really what it does, it comes down to a situation where you just don't have a location agreement. So you technically didn't have permission to shoot there. Mm-hmm. It is in theory, private property. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, is the owner going to sue? He might, I don't know. Like it, it, that's where your, um, your, uh, errors and omissions insurance is supposed to come into play, mm-hmm. but they are taking the, they taking the position that, um, you know, they're taking the position that you have these agreements in hand and thus mm-hmm. are free. So my feeling would be don't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, either use Airbnb to find places mm-hmm. 
you know, like that's great. It's actually a great thing. And then contact the owner and say, we're interested in filming. You know, we're going to be a small crew. Yeah. Like it's going to be four or five people like you, you know, and then see if the, they might charge you a little bit more, mm-hmm. you know, in our case, our case, he didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where I, I, I would, if you have money, mm-hmm. I would avoid trying to do it sketch in a sketchy way. <laughs> right. Um, in a complete you know, gorilla way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen on layover, we did it. You know, mm-hmm. and nothing's nothing's ever come up uh, on it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we figured the movie was so small that nobody would ever notice. Right. Um, and we've we've been right. But I would I, I can't recommend it. Sure. Um, of course. But it is certainly a, a way of doing it. Now, um, th- but my feeling is most owners are cool. What they don't want are yeah, 50 full- people coming in the house. And right. Trucks and all that stuff. Right. Of course. But if you have look, look, I'm going to shoot some stuff. It's non pornographic, <laughs> <Right, laughs> which I'm exactly. sure you, you have to tell them that it. it's non pornographic. Yeah, it's non pornographic. And, you know, we're shooting this movie and here we are. And yeah. And if you have a little bit of a track record behind you, you can send it. Look, this is my website. This is who I am. I'm a professional. Right. And, and, you know, hop on the phone, like talk to them. Like usually they're, they're cool, you know, and especially if it's a chance to make a little extra money, they just don't want the place trashed. Right. That's all they care about. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now I, I did see some scenes in the movie that you actually shot in, uh, in that, um, that Mexico. Oh God, what's that little, not little Mexico, but that place downtown. What is it called? Oh yeah. The, the, uh, well there's, there's the Chinese market and the town in Chinatown. And then there's the, uh, yeah, what's it's a square? I forget. What yeah, the, it is. the Mexican square. Yeah, it's run right off, right across the street from um, the uh, the train station, Union Station, Union yep. Station, right? So, I, you know, I've been there. I've been to both those locations, and when I saw it pop up, I'm like, "Son of a bitch, shot there!" <laughs> and I'm like, "How did he?" I'm like, and then I'm like, "Oh, he must have gone there early morning and got some stuff." But then I saw you going inside, like where there's other people, other things. And now, and obviously you don't have you don't have any permits because that's not cheap, uh, right? Especially in L.A. That's what I find your work so amazing uh, from a, from another L.A. perspective because I know how difficult it is. It, this is not you know you know this is not Wyoming like you, you right. It, 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 everyone's very savvy here, uh, but if you keep a low profile, I'm just curious how did you finagle that how did you shoot in the, in the mexican square and also in chinatown and like you even went behind the scenes some places and you know walked yeah in. so how did you do uh, that so you just have to be it's the same way we did a lot of stuff on layover you just have you have to kind of scout everything mm-hmm. and have an idea of what you're up against right mm-hmm. and so in the case of like the little square the mexican square we went up there and we had like um you know, so we sh- so the first thing we did was we shot on the we shot this pretty much the whole movie on the Canon C100 Mark II, mm-hmm. um, and and I had basically the Canon camera, a lens, and a Shogun recorder because um, so in addition to directing this, I also DP'd it. Right. Um, and uh, you know, I was I had decided to shoot with a LUT uh, as an overlay, and so with the recorder, I was able to see sort of what approximately what the final image was going to look like mm-hmm. um, because the LUT I was using really crushed blacks and I just, I, I couldn't do it on the fly. Like I had to know what I was getting. Mm-hmm. So, but that said, it was still a very small compact package mm-hmm. where like if somebody was standing in front of me, you'd never see the camera. Mm-hmm. So we had that going for us. So the ability to sort of run around LA and just kind of like pick stuff off, mm-hmm. um, you know, was, was key because we were moving so quickly that nobody had time to even pay attention to us. And we had such a small camera and we did not have any boom guys or anything like that, that like, you know, you draw couldn't attention help, but to, right. you didn't draw attention to it. Yeah, exactly. In the case of the square, we actually went there and we, we didn't, we didn't know that you had to have a permit. We assumed it was just public space, <laughs> which it might be, it might not be. I'm it's, not sure. It's not. <laughs> I've looked so into we, it. We, right. So we basically said, okay, well, this is what we need. So let's just kind of like, put the tripod down and it was me, the tripod camera producer and the two actors. Mm-hmm. And we started rolling. And then, um, a guy came up, security guard came up and he was like, Oh, you need to get a permit. Oh, we didn't know that. We're sorry. Hang on. Like my producer, why don't you go find out what's going on? So like he went, he's like, yeah, you gotta go talk to this guy. So I was like, all right, well, we'll just stay here and you go do that. So like he basically, our producer went away to find out what, what the deal was with getting a permit. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, yeah. we just kept shooting. Mm-hmm. You know, I just kept saying, like, just keep doing it, literally just walk and then go back. Like, you know, you have to be you have to have communication with your actors. You have to say, like, you just need to keep repeating it. I will shoot it. But just keep doing when you get to the end, turn around, walk back and do it again. Mm-hmm. And I'll get all the coverage of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And by the time he came back and he said, well, yeah, you normally need a permit. Like, oh, we're sorry. We didn't know. We're just like film students, like fucking around. We don't really like, you know, we apologize. We're just doing some tests. 
you know, just whatever the sort of BS answer is, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, and then you walk away and you've got your footage. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, in the Chinese market, we just kind of walked through it and shot as we went and nobody really paid attention to us. And we, um, you know, just sort of shot these pieces that I then cut together later now, into this into this chase. Now, with that, how do you deal with other people's faces and stuff like that? You just uh, you either cut it out or you just stay so blurry and so movement based that you know you just kind of get away with it. Got it? Because yeah, that's always a concern if you're shooting in a public place. You got to get permission from people you're putting it, on. Yeah, I mean that's what we did with layover. Was you know we basically just I I tried to keep it so that you didn't ever really see people's faces, or I just cut it out. Mm-hmm. You know, so like if you see people's faces, we had permission from them. If, if you don't, then we didn't. Um, and the same thing for um, negative. Same thing for negative. Yeah. Okay. So if we see, so, yeah, because I saw some guy walk behind you with some iPod and he looked directly into the camera. I'm like, I wonder if they got permission for that. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it not. Depends. If you're in a public area, it's different. Oh, okay. So if you're in a public you know, area, you're you're if you're in a, if you're in a pub. Well, I, yeah, again, yeah. all these things are like a little sketchy, sketchy right? Yes, like, yes, if you're, yes. Like if you're in a public area, like you know, filming on a public street, and you're like a small crew, usually you can get away with stuff. And like people assume that by being in a public area, you're being photographed. Like it's just. It's just something that that you deal with. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't sure, sure, on sure. TV. Like, sure, sure, sure. You know, consult all this. But in our in our case, we just again, what we tried to do was remove obstacles that would put us in a position of of not being able to make the movie. You know, got it. And so in this case, it was like, let's just go for it. You know, if we end up having to blur his face, fine, we'll blur his face. Like, big right. deal. Exactly. Or, um, you, or you recrop it or something like that to just yeah. yeah. You know exactly. Um, you know, in the ter- terms of cases that were like more private, we tried to avoid it if we could. Um, but if we couldn't, then we just hoped that like, you know, they're probably not going to see the movie anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, um, how did you light scenes? Because, uh, you know, you move very quickly and I'm assuming when you're out there and, you know, uh, you know, shooting without a lot a lo- a lo- a lo- permits and things like that, you're not really lighting anything. So how did you light scenes that you were have you did have some control over? So we basically just used very small sources. We had a small lighting kit of like Kinos, uh, one by one light panels. Um, you know, we, we would get, uh, we'd scale up and get a lighting package of like, you know, some Aries six fifties and, and things like that. Um, but the goal, the goal for a lot of it, especially, so pretty much during the daytime, we didn't, we didn't light, we just used natural light. Mm -hmm. Um, for any of the nighttime stuff, what we tried to really do, what I tried to really do was step into, step into a location and say, cause I usually would pick the locations for how they looked. Right. I, mm-hmm. we didn't go into any place where we're like, we're redressing everything cause we mm-hmm. didn't have a production designer. Mm-hmm. So like for the motel, in the case of the motel, right? Like the motel we owned, like we went in there and we got permission and we owned the entire motel during our, during our shoot. But what we didn't do is go get a permit to do it. Right. You know, because we're up in the middle of the desert. Like, yeah, nobody's paying attention. No one's like, gonna. and we're a small crew. We don't, again, we don't have trucks. We don't have a big footprint. Mm-hmm. So nobody knows. No, if you drove by the motel, you'd have no idea that anybody was shooting there. Right, right. So what we would do is literally just try and, and make use of what exist, what existed, you know, like what was already there. And then what I did, and this was one of the reasons I also decided to DP it, mm-hmm. was one of the reasons why, um, one of the things that I was always frustrated by was certain DPs, and I love the DPs I've worked with, but still, is that they have a, a knack for refusing to shoot above 3,200 ISO. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even on cameras that you know can handle it. Sure. And I had a belief that we could push, certainly the Canon cameras, that mm-hmm. we could push them far beyond 3,200 ISO and still be okay. Mm-hmm. And what that was going to get us back was time. Mm-hmm. Because it was less time lighting, it was less time having to have crew stand around doing stuff. So I would go into locations and I would say, okay, like it's a little dim. At what ISO does this, as it is, look work for exposure levels? Mm-hmm. So I, so then I'd set it. If it was like you know fifteen thousand ISO, I'd be like, all right, no, we can't do that. But if mm-hmm. it was five sixty four, mm-hmm. I would I would do that. And then I'd say, what need do what do we need to add? So I tried to basically make use of what already existed in the space, and then we did either enhance it or take it away depending on what the scene called for. Mm-hmm. But it was using a lot of practical lighting, a lot of existing lighting, and then you know in and, certain and cases when, just when, enhancing it. Now, when you're saying practical lighting, are you adding 
photo, like, are you adding like photo bulbs in it, you know, color temperature, you know, corrected bulbs, or are you just using whatever bulbs are in the house? Uh, well, we brought our own bulbs because, you know, you just don't know what works, but, right. um, you know, for the most part you're using what's there. So in the case of like the house, uh, that, that they get to Rodney's house, mm-hmm. that was all just whatever was there, okay. you know, and then we would bring in a light or two just to help fill in or, or take care of whatever was there. And, um, you know, in the case of like the motel, it was like, oh, let's, we have a lamp here. Like, we'll just, we'll just take the bulb out of here and we'll put in a bulb that we know is going to be consistent and work okay mm-hmm. for our purposes. But you know, with, with, when you're shooting at a high ISO, you don't need that. You don't have to go back to the 250 watt bulbs anymore. No, you know, no. you can put in the 60 Watts and the 40 Watts mm-hmm. and be completely okay. And so, um, it was really trying to just be as fast as possible. So I'd say like in most cases we had, you know, a couple of lights mm-hmm. just helping to fill stuff in. Okay. So like a lot of China balls. A lot of, not even a lot of China balls. Like I, I actually kind of like uh, some harder sources. So we found ourselves taking some like six fifties and punching them through a window, mm-hmm. you know, um, and also lighting space. Like it was very, it's always very important to me that we try and light as much of the space as we can, as opposed to right. lighting That's the actually. actors on a mark. Right. Because I just, I don't like confining my actors to a mark. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I like to light a bigger space and let them move within it. Mm-hmm. And have the freedom to explore and try things. And then sometimes you're like, okay, you got to basically stand here. Right. But other times I try to be very open to it. So it was it was trying to use practical lighting. It was shooting at high ISOs. Mm-hmm. And it was just trying – because I just I, – I love – for me personally, I love realism. I love having something be as gritty and as realistic as, as, as it can. And so that means mixing color temps. That means having imperfect lighting. That means having shadows. That means – you know, having all this stuff that normally you try and get rid of, because I find when you get rid of all that stuff, there's just an artificiality in my own work that I don't like. Right. Which is, I like feeling like we're there, you know, and that means shooting more handheld, shooting grittier, darker, using things that are messy. I just like messiness in, mm-hmm. in my own work. Now with, with you, you basically handheld a lot of the movie yourself. I operated the whole movie. Okay. So then you were just holding Basically, just holding the camera. Did you have a handheld rig? How did you actually it, do it? It it depended. So if we were doing stuff on the down low, uh, mm-hmm. it would just be the stripped down version of the camera. No map box, like nothing like that. It was basically the lens, and I used the I would use the twenty four to one hundred five lens because I could use the autofocus capabilities of the C one hundred Mark II. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to worry about pulling focus. Um, so in that case, it was that. In other cases where we were under control or weren't worried about. Um, you know, somebody seeing the camera, I have a, a handheld rig, shoulder rig that mm-hmm. I, I build up with follow focus, map box, like the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'd usually operate off of that. And then occasionally we did some stuff on sticks, um, you know, and then I did one scene with Steadicam, which um, I didn't ever do again. But uh, <laughs> not with Steadicam or with a, a gimbal or with the, sorry, with a gl- Well, it was with a glide cam okay. that I that I operated. <laughs> um, but it just it, it just was like much harder than I thought. I mean, I've done it, but mm-hmm. it was harder on this than I thought it was going to be. And I'm like, I'm just going to handhold this for the rest of the time. Got it. Got it. Now, how did you record audio, which I know is a big thing? I know sometimes when you're out on the street, I, I noticed that most of that stuff is MOS or, or yeah. not sound. Right. So, you know, we would either just go MOS, mm-hmm. you know, and know that what my sound designers would fill it in later mm-hmm. um, or – we would have them labbed and then it would be lo- going to a like H4N recorder that I would carry in a bag with me. So mm-hmm. like the scene where they walk through Union Station, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. there's a dialogue scene there. That was that they were already labbed and they basically just did. I just told them as soon as we get in that great hall, you got to do your lines. So now, like, how, just do them once. How was it shooting at Union? Did they get any shit? Oh, no, because all, literally what you see in the movie is the one take that we did. You just like, walk. You just walk. We just walked. Yeah. We basically, the route that they take where they get on the train in Chinatown, mm-hmm. they ride the train, they get off in Union Station, they get out, they walk through the tunnel, they walk through the Great Hall, and then walk outside. Like that was literally me just filming the entire time. Like we just did the route and then I just recorded it. And then, no, I knew I was just going to cut it up. Right. Of course. But I just kept the camera rolling to keep all this stuff and get all this great, you know, all this great material. And then we added stuff like the drone shots of the subway and things like that or right. the metro. And so, um, so in that case, like, no, I was just like, listen, when we get into Union Station, you got to do your dialogue lines. They're like, okay. And we had them labbed and we got what we got. 
And I knew, okay, I'll stay on their back. So like, if we have to, we'll ADR it, you know, like I'll, I, I could add it in later. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, so we do something like that. And then in other cases where we were under control or we weren't worried about anybody coming and, you know, getting pissed at us or mm-hmm, finding us, mm-hmm. we basically had, we hired a sound guy to come out and actually right. lab them correctly and boom it and do mm-hmm. all that stuff. Now, did you, and did you actually just drop the recorders like in their pocket while they're walking or was it all wireless? It was wireless and then, uh, wireless labs out to the recorder, which was in my bag. And I was like always right behind them. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they just had the labs sort of tucked into their pocket. God, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, you're just you're just hiding it. You know, you're just they're just always mic'd. And yeah. you're just like you're subversively like, okay, guys, I just need you to clap. Like just do a clap really quick, you know, and like whatever. And, and, I was, and uh I was but I, again it's like you get just get you just get like you're listen, you're taking a risk. I understand that. But like in low budget, I'm like, why not? Like what do you have to lose? Like you have to go reshoot the scene somewhere else? Like, all right, big deal. You know, right. like People just don't care. Ultimately, they don't care. What they don't want you to do is messing up the space, messing with customers, like, you know, or whatever. Be blatant, they're not, they're or not, being blatant about it. Yeah, they're not out hunting you down after the movie's been made. Because, like, frankly, they don't know. Do they know, like, there was a movie negative that shot in a parking garage and they had permission or not had permission? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, are there records of that? No. Like, I mean, there might be permit records, but I can't imagine they're totally complete, mm-hmm. you know? And I can't imagine that somebody's full-time job is tra- going and watching movies and saying, did we permit that scene? Right. Yeah. No one, no one ever. Yeah. That never happens. And also, frankly, like, you know, what I've learned is with a permit, a permit just gives you the right to be there at that moment. Mm -hmm. It's not a binding contract. Like, you know, you have to have a location agreement. If it's a public thing, you can get away with it. You know, if it's not a public thing, like Like they might track you down, they might not track you down. But again, it's like, do you want to make your movie or not? You know, like, amen. No, I mean, it's like, to me, it's like the whole old, the old Werner Herzog thing of like, you know, learn to forge. <laughs> yeah, like he for, he used to forge uh, his permit. Like, yeah, he's like a, a, a permit or something like that. He forged literally. And he had like a military ger- general in front of him or something. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> you know, and so to me, really what this is and, you know, it sort of depends, you know, whatever your uh, ultimate opinion of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'm also trying to do is just provide a, a – I, I'm sort of taking the lead on a different way of doing things that sort of creates – it gets away from this idea of like, if you don't have money, you can't make something with scope. Yes. You know? Um, and a lot of that involves breaking rules and like, you know what? Let's just do it. You know, like uh, they're not paying attention. No, I mean, I was, I was, when I was, uh, shooting a, a scene for my movie going up to the Hollywood sign, I was deathly afraid. I was like, it was just me and a camera and my two actors. And, right. and I was, I was deathly afraid I was going to get caught. And then halfway up the hike, I'm like, there ain't nobody coming. No. You literally could bring a steady cam rig up there. By the time they show up, you've got the shots. Right. Exactly. You know? and by the way, like it's weird because uh, cameras nowadays are just so small all over the place. They're yeah. just so, well, everyone is filming, right? right. Everyone is filming. Vloggers, you know, everyone's got vloggers, something. Vloggers, yeah. self-filming, like people just it's just everywhere. And so it's just one of those things where people just have stopped paying attention. And, you know, are you kidding me? Like, do you think like the bureaucracy of L.A. has somebody like really trying to find out like if you had permission to shoot? No, exactly. But that said, that said, it's frustrating that L.A. makes it so difficult. I have a buddy of mine who just did who just he's shooting a web series. Good Mm -hmm. friend of mine, college roommate. He lives in New York and Mm -hmm. he just shot a web series. He was in Times Square (laughs) with like a full airy rig sound guy. No deal. No. And 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 a guy in a mascot outfit. And I said, how did you get away with that? He's like. Well, basically, New York has now said that, like, if you're handheld and you're not putting any equipment down, uh, down, you can shoot anywhere public in, in any uh, public space. That's actually including Times Square. That's actually the law in L.A. I found out. Right. As long as well, you that's why I was able. Yeah, that's why I was able to get away with a lot of the stuff I got away with. Right. As long as you don't put sticks down. Second, you put sticks yep. down, you're done. Then, yep. then and, they got and you. And you're you're like under a certain amount of people. Like you can't have like. 20 people around you right like so that. if you're so like, like if you're three, like three four people or something yeah if you got two or three people with you and you're just walking around with a camera you can you get away with a lot and legal, oh, yeah. legally legally you can get yep. away with a lot if it's, legally exactly you know. and so but you know and the funny part is about my friend's experience because you think Times square it's like impossible right it's like right. they're not gonna let you do I'm, that. i was uh, that's an airy rig for god's sakes i know the biggest thing they got in trouble for was their mascot who was like you know he was one of those like furry characters sure, sure. Uh-huh. you know like the elmos yeah 
he was not in the space that they were supposed to be in. Like, you know, mascots that were the figures <laughs> in it, Times Square have to be in a certain space. Right. So a cop came over and he's like, uh, you're not allowed to be in here. And they're like, well, we, we're with the camera. And he's like, no, the, the furry guy, he's got to go into the green box. And so, like, basically they just went over to the green box and they shot their movie. Um, you know, so it's like – so L.A., yeah. So I did know that. But it, but even just the permitting process in L.A. is such a nightmare. We had oh. such a nightmare for another sequence that we actually did permit. Did the shootout you? sequence, and it was just such a headache. Did you and, and you shot, but it was out in the desert. It was out in the desert, but what happened was, it was within a certain number of feet from a neighborhood, mm-hmm. and has because we were going to be firing blanks mm. in the middle of the night past a certain time, mm-hmm. we had to go to the neighborhood and we had to go around and do what's called a survey. Oh Jesus! So you have to get. It's not getting permission. It's just literally going around and saying, hey, we're going to be firing off weapons like and dropping stuff at their door and saying, like, we just want to make you aware. Can you don't, acknowledge don't, that you've been told this? And don't call and they'll call the police. <laughs> right. And so the funny part was, first of all, you have to go do this. And we found this out the week before we were going to be shooting. So I'm driving up to this area, which is like an hour and a half outside of L.A. Mm-hmm. and doing all these like surveys. And you have to have like a 60 percent response rate, right? Like 60 percent of the neighborhood. Oh. Meanwhile, all these half these homes are like derelict. Yeah. And like nobody lives there. Right. And then the other half, I'm getting them and they're like, yeah, whatever. Like people are shooting guns up here all the time. (laughs) Right. Right. So they don't care. And then L.A. goes L.A. film goes up and they they put the 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 notice of filming in everyone's boxes. And then they charge you for it. Of course they do. And then we finally go to shoot and we had a sort of down the hill from where we were shooting. We were shooting up on this mountaintop that was kind of this – like it was sort of in a bowl, mm-hmm. bit of a bowl. Mm-hmm. And sort of on, on the mountain that was close to the neighborhood. I mean it was far away. It was like more than half a mile. But like the we had an RV for actors and sort of base camp. And so as we started doing the weapons, we would – we radioed down and we're like, do you guys hear any of this? And they're like, no. <laughs> we can't hear anything. Oh my God. So it like just ended up becoming this massive headache and you know LA film you know is just profiting of from course they are. the ridicu- the ridiculousness the high fees so we're just like fuck it like why even bother like it's like sag you know it's like if you don't have to go through them like why go through them like what's the incentive like they're not helping you they're not making your life easier they're making it more difficult and the only reason we did it was because we were doing blank fire weapons so we just had to we owed a responsibility towards that process but if you, you were know, shooting that we, like that we weren't going to try and shoot but if but we were just oh we shot up in the desert so much yeah I mean, but if you're just going to shoot like airsoft weapons that have no sound oh you could you could get away with it right right like if you have a nice recoil put some v, some, yeah. some vfx in and you're out the door Right, but you know what? I was like, we have money. We're doing, no, yeah, we're yeah. Work. You have a hundred thousand dollars. Like, yeah, you have. A, yeah, <laughs> no, you're not I making. Perso- I personally wanted to, but a lot of the. Uh, by the way, a lot of that. A lot of the other parts of the film, aside from that shootout, those are airsoft weapons. Mm-hmm. You know, so we we went that route for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was doing. Um, you that. know, when we were doing things subversively, and we didn't have like time, and we didn't want to hire a sheriff, and we mm-hmm. didn't want to hire all this. Oh so. gosh, can you imagine? And you yeah. had to hire. I'm assuming you had to hire a police at that that night, or no? We did. We yeah, we had to have a sheriff come out. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, and they, they of course, like, we had to dispute with them because, like, you know, they were like, well, it's this much. And then he had to, like, drive back. And we're, we're just like, but, you like, why are you – you're telling us you're charging us more because you couldn't find a deputy within a 60 minutes of, like, the location? Like, why is that our problem? Mm-hmm. You know? And so it's like – it's just – it's everybody's out with – got their hand out when you start doing stuff like that, which is why movies end up costing so much. Right. And then that's why filmmakers can't make money and then they stop making movies. Yeah, so it's like part of it's like, you know what, let's subvert the system a bit, you know, in order to get the movie made, and let's see if we get what we can get away with. If we can't get away with it, we'll put a little money into it. You know? it but it, it was, um, it just, it ends up constricting you in ways that I understand, I get it, but at the same time, like, why not try to do something different? No, and it, you know, you, you got to have that kind of pirate attitude about it, you know? like kinda, I think so. I mean, for low-budget stuff. You've got to, you know? And, and that's what I love about your story with Negative is that you took that pirate attitude and, and added $100,000. Because if for a $100,000 movie, a $100,000 kind of action spy movie. And yeah. on top of that, though, if you would have tried to shoot this movie in the traditional standpoint with a regular crew – and regular everything, you would have never made it. Never would have oh, made yeah. it. Never. It would have been way too, one. It would have been too expensive. 
Mm-hmm. You would have had to have way more of the budget. Mm-hmm. Or two, it would have been the whole movie would have been in Rodney's house. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You know? it, it just it – just, you because you end up paying for – the problem is, like I said, going to that, back to that production model. What you lose is the stuff that ends up appearing on screen. You don't right. lose the stuff that's like surrounding the set. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. You know, the trucks, the trailers, the actors have to sit in their trailer and air conditioning and all this stuff. Like, you know, you end up losing all the time to get the really great stuff and the scope, you know. And in this movie, like you saw, it's like a road movie. I mean, we we did the road trip. Right. It's like a couple hundred bucks to drive to Arizona and back. And meanwhile, we got all this great stuff. We got them driving into Phoenix. Like we were able to get all these things that like in a normal movie, it would have been way too much of a pain. For somebody to figure out how to do. Now, and you also had a couple actors who were really game for all of this. There, I mean, in your experience working with actors, are they all, you know, the, that you've worked with? You know, you tell them right up about like, look, this is what we're doing. We're doing this on the down low. We're doing this on a pirate style, gorilla style. Are you cool with it? it oh may, yeah, for sure. Because I mean, and they all love it. They, <laughs> they do, don't it. they? They all do love it, don't they? <laughs> they love it, and so like you know. I mean, you know, like with, with Sebastian who plays uh, – Sebastian Roche who plays Rodney. Like we're like, yeah, man, come out to Palm Springs. We'll shoot you for two days and, and then you're done. He's like, awesome. You know, and it's a fun role. Mm-hmm. It's like a role he doesn't get to play. He gets to do a fight scene. Mm-hmm. You know, um, in the case of Katya and Simon, like, I mean, they were there from the beginning. They were there before we had a script. Right. I was attached to do another movie with them and that was taking forever. And I said, would you guys like to do something kind of like layover, which is they both seen and loved. And that's what got me attached to the other movie we were doing. Mm-hmm. And, um, which funny enough, that other movie, which a couple million dollars, like sadly it didn't work out, you know, as most things do. But in the meantime, I got, I got them and I said, would you like to do a sort of layover style movie? That's this spy thriller, you know? And I told Katya, I'm like, you're going to get to play a character that you're not getting pitched for and mm-hmm. you're not getting cast for. Mm-hmm. And with Simon, it was like, you know, an opportunity to, to, to do a really different character, to mm-hmm. work with Katya. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, we're just going to – you guys will have ownership of the film, and we're just going to go do it in this, like, really pirate way. And, and like you said, and they were, like, totally game for it. I mean, they were, they were awesome. Never complained, never had problems. Even when, they're, when we're in the desert in the middle of, like, you know, it's 30 – it's 22 degrees and freezing in January. Mm-hmm. Like, they were out there, like – doing it and they they were loving it because what i said to them was what you're not going to have is a trailer and you're not going to have all these other things that you can get on the other shows you do Mm -hmm. what i'm going to give you is time and i'm giving give you an opportunity to really explore these characters to really like be a part of this process and to feel like you're going to leave each day feeling like you didn't never feeling like you didn't get it Mm -hmm. you know because they they came from the world of tv Mm-hmm. doing stuff where like, you know, Katya on Sleepy Hollow, they do three takes and they're moving on. Right. You know? And so I said, like, we're going to, we're going to take the time to do it because what I do with, with way I, the way I work, everything I do with, in terms of like, you know, using existing lighting, not setting marks, using a lot of handheld, what it's all designed for beyond a certain stylistic approach is what it's designed for is designed to give the actors the freedom to do really great stuff. Mm-hmm. It's to not constrict them in any way. It's all about the actors. And then I step around the actors with the camera to figure out what the best thing is for the camera to do. Mm-hmm. But it starts with the actors and the blocking and the scene and giving them freedom to move and freedom to try things. And then I capture that. That's what right. I try to do. That's the Rather co- than try to stage them for a camera that may not be the place that gives them the most freedom. And then they're thinking too much about it. They're like, am I hitting my marks? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? And of course, there's some of that. Of course, you have but it's to. All yeah. desi- it's all designed to allow actors to try and give the best performance that they possibly can. And that's uh, that was the Kubrick model. You know, Kubrick yeah. did the exact same thing. He would he's he never have a shot list. He would just show up on the day and go, all right, let's work it out. And that was yeah. the other thing that he really wanted time. You yeah, know? everyone always thought that he was this crazy it's, man, but he wasn't. He actually just stripped it down to a what do I need, and that gives me the extra sixty days. That I get to sit yeah, here and play. Like, exactly. Because that's what the most valuable thing is. That's what everybody's always fighting for, right? Like everybody, you're always on a clock. Mm-hmm. And if you can just strip away some of those things. Like I I don't think we ever shot a full 12-hour day on this movie. <laughs> right. And except for the fight scene. The fight scene because we did it all in one day. Right. Um, but I never left a day feeling like we didn't get it. Right. And I've left other projects feeling like we, we just didn't have time to really get it. You know, and I know that. 
And on this one, I was like, I don't want that to happen, which is why I approached it the way I did and why I only went after $100,000 because I wanted enough money to actually make it mm-hmm. like that I knew we'd need to make it. Mm-hmm. But I wanted so little that whoever gave it to me, they weren't going to be able to pay attention. You know, right. they, they weren't going to have the time to devote to maintaining it, you know, keeping an eye on a $100,000 movie. Right. And, and they have the confidence based on your track record and what you've done that, right. you, that you'll be able to deliver. Right. In fact, the funny part now is Mar Vista comes back and they go, man, I wish we'd given you a little bit more money. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, oh, not we... because we didn't have anything, but they were like, what, what could you have done if you had an extra 50 grand or like, you know, something like that? Well, let's talk about the next movie then. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Now, you, you talked a little bit about SAG. Can you explain to the listeners how you dealt with SAG? Because SAG can be a bit of a pain when it comes to filmmakers. You know, they're wonderful for actors, but they they can be a little bit uh, cut, um, a little bit tough to deal with. Uh, yeah. So what what was how did you approach SAG in uh, in this project? So I mean, I've always had a great relationship with SAG in the past. Like I've always I've never really had any problems with them. I know people have, but I've never really suffered through issues except of like I made a mistake and I didn't pay the P and H and I thought I did and like whatever you know. And then they then they come after you. Um, but in terms of this, I did the same thing that I did on layover, which is I went through the SAG new media agreement Mm -hmm. and they are, they're obviously getting, they're sort of cracking down because obviously people are taking advantage, but basically the premise is if your, if your film is, or project is going to premiere online, then you're allowed to go through the SAG new media agreement. Mm -hmm. The reason why I go through it is one, I don't know if this movie was ever going to get theatrical, Mm -hmm. right? And it didn't. So good thing I didn't bother going through the theatrical ultra low budget agreement, right? Because mm-hmm. it would have been a waste of time. Mm-hmm. So I go through SAG New Media because one, um, you don't have to escrow your actors' fees, your mm-hmm. actor fees. So mm-hmm. so if you go through like ultra low budget theatrical, you have to take the same. You have to, if you have you have to take a hundred percent of your actor fees, um, and you have to reserve it to pay your actors, and then you have to take double the, uh, that amount again, and you have to give it to SAG. Mm-hmm. And SAG basically holds on to it to guarantee that your talent is going to get paid. You don't get that money back until you turn in all the paperwork and you've executed all the documents that SAG requires uh, in order to get that money back. On an ultra low budget movie, there's a ton of paperwork that you have to deal with. Mm-hmm. I made that mistake on, on layover. I initially applied for ultra low budget because I was like, well, what else do I do? And my buddy was like, no, do SAG New Media. So SAG New Media has very simple paperwork. It's very clear. It's easy to understand. Mm-hmm. They have a situation where you can negotiate your the fees or defer the fees with the actors. Mm-hmm. Now, what I do is I don't do that because, mm-hmm. one, we have money in the budget, so there's no reason not to pay your actors and not to pay your crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we do is we basically pay the actors the minimum required by the next contract up, which mm-hmm. is, I believe, the ultra-low budget or something like that, which is 100 or 125 a day, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what we pay our actors, even though we don't have to. And Mm -hmm. we do that because if the movie were to get theatrical, we don't then owe a bunch of money to actors in order to get that theatrical distribution. We basically can call SAG. We can scale up to the next agreement, and we don't have to do anything other Mm -hmm. than inform SAG that we've now had a theatrical, which changes how the residuals get doled out. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you don't have to provide proof of insurance. You don't have to provide like all these other things. It's a much simpler process to getting your movie made. And the, and if you do end up getting theatrical, well, it's a very simple process of scaling up to the next the next uh, contract, provided mm-hmm. that you paid the actors the minimum that that contract then requires. Now, what what about uh, with the new media? Is there a residual situation there or not? Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember if there is. Um, I don't think there is. I don't think there is, but I could be wrong. Sure. Don't trust my my opinion. Yeah, I always check it um, out. Yeah, yeah. This the fortunate thing is like you know with with new media, there's also minimums like in terms of like how much you're spending per minute. That's like we never got close to. <laughs> so, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Um, and so you know, but I found that SAG has always been very helpful, and I basically always start off with any project at this stage. You know, these types of films saying, I don't know if it's going to get theatrical. I'm just going to go through new media. This is mm-hmm. the project. I log in. You know, I sign up for the project. I provide the, the company papers, whatever they need. Mm-hmm. And uh, they get they basically have, uh, you know, give me the docs and say, send it in when you're done. And, and, I, you do. and then you – did you have – opened up a, an LLC for this company? I'm assuming. This movie, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, on this one we did. Yeah. So we opened up an LLC. But with L, but Layover, you did your own production company? 
Layover, we did it through our own production company. Okay. My, my production company, yeah. Got it. Now, so, just yeah, just for protection as far as, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but it's such well, a small Well, and this one, this one we had different ownership structures. So what I did on this was, you know, again, like myself, Adam Gaines, who wrote the movie, mm-hmm. uh, Katya and Simon, like, you know, we paid ourselves a little bit of money. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But not a lot, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, and I knew that going in. I said, "This is not a mo- this is not a project where we're all making money." So, um, you know, just to make everything fair, here's what we're going to do: we're all going to have a fifth ownership of whatever profit participation that we get out of Marvista. Mm-hmm. You know, so whatever the money get, that gets made by you know by the film, we'll split evenly five ways. So that also made it better for us to go through a different, you know, through, go through a unique LLC. Right. Um, in order to just maintain that ownership structure. But that was also one, one thing we did was saying, I can't pay any money, but we'll, we all have equal shares. Right. And they're, they're doing it because they want to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're working. Actors. I always, um, yeah. Mark Polish, who's a Yo. buddy of mine and, and, um, has a, we, we talk every now and then he, he, his whole thing is like, if an actor asks how much they're getting paid, they don't actually want to do your project. <laughs> That's a very good yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Michael Polish and, uh, I've, okay. I, yeah. And I talked to him about his movie, um, for lovers only, which was yep. uh, you remember that one? Yep, yeah, that, that inspired. That was an inspiration for layover. Yeah, and it's an inspiration. Yeah. It was an inspiration for my movie Meg. You know, this is Meg, and and it was just like these guys just went out and to Paris. <laughs> yeah, it just oh, shot yeah. an entire and it shot an entire movie, basically just the two of them and her. Yeah, and occasionally the sound guy would show up. I was like, what? And they made half a million with it, uh, which yeah. is not which is not. Bad. <laughs> no, it's not bad at all. I'd take it. Not bad at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now you've got um four you said about four to five crew members were at the top uh, at the top end yeah. as far as the production. Can again, can you break down what those crew members were and what they did specifically so people have an idea? Yeah, so I like I said, so I directed it. Mm-hmm. Um and I camera. DP'd it I DP'd it as well and operated. So mm-hmm. that's two roles that I then took on. Mm-hmm. Um We'd have a producer, you know, Will, who would show up and kind of help out. I mean, he'd do everything from slating a scene to, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, wrangling things to helping light. You know, I mean, it was an all in process for all of us. Mm -hmm. And then we had a sound guy who pretty much just focused on the sound, which Mm -hmm. is all I wanted him doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was like the core group of of us. And Mm -hmm. then um, I'd say that was like 60 percent of the time. That was that was the crew. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and Adam would come by set and he'd help out. Um, and then we, we, we scale up to sort of the next level and that would include like having a guy who was a gaffer. So he'd come out and like basically help us light, help take on some lighting for myself mm-hmm. so I could work with the actors. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd have a, we had our stunt guy cause we did a number of stunts. So we had, um, this great, um, great stunt coordinator named Daniel Losacero, who's like, I mean, right now he's working with, uh, Tom Cruise on mission impossible six, like <laughs> okay. awesome, awesome dude. Um, but he was trying to get into coordinating and he's a great fight coordinator. So mm-hmm. like he ended up not only doing the fight coordination for the fight that's in the movie, mm-hmm. but he also would come out and handle help with any stunts, you know, that mm-hmm. we would do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would, um, on a, some of the stuff later in the movie when Kati is like all beat up and mm-hmm. bruised, mm-hmm. like, you know, we have a makeup guy who would come out. Did a good job by the way. The makeup looked great. great. Yeah. The makeup guy was so fantastic and, and obviously did us a huge favor coming out with some and doing some of that stuff. Um, and then, um, let's see. And then, uh, I think after that, it, it was like our big shootout day where we would have an armor and we had a couple gaffers and, and grips like to come out and help move lights. That was a big budget day. That was the big budget day, big budget weekend rather. Yeah. Right. And, um, but that was as big as it got. I mean, maybe 10, 15 people total on set on, uh, on, on the biggest days. And that was, yeah. Cause you were doing basically a full blown action sequence. Yeah, exactly. Now, can you give any, uh, you know, tips like go to tips for lo- shooting on locations without a permit that you like you have to do this you have to do this you have to do this um yeah okay so you got to strip down the camera to okay. as small as possible mm-hmm. you got to scout that location as much as you can mm-hmm. different times of the day or at the time of day when you want to shoot um so you have to have a really i mean you have to have a great understanding of of what the scenario is in that location right if you're in the middle of the desert fine but mm-hmm. if you're trying to shoot downtown What's it look like? You know, are there cops around? Like, if you try and walk in and start <laughs> shooting like in a Grand Central Station, it's like a heist. 
It's like, hi, seriously, you got a case to join. You can't, you're casing the joint. You got a case to join. Um, right. And, and uh, I mean, an example of this, right, is, uh, is the, the scene in Layover where they're, they're looking out over the city. They're sitting on the lookout. Mm-hmm. Um, that was shot at the lookout over Mulholland mm-hmm. um, because that was the best point of view. Mm-hmm. Now, what I knew was I knew a couple things from having gone up there all the, a couple of days in mm-hmm. scouting. I knew that it was the last location on the park police route for when they closed down the park. <laughs> I knew that the sun set about eight o'clock mm-hmm. and they didn't close it until about 1030. Mm-hmm. So I knew I'd probably have about an hour, hour and a half to shoot the scene, mm-hmm. meaning I needed all the blue out of the sky, mm-hmm. you know? So like I'd have an hour, an hour and a half. I also knew that people were up there all the time mm-hmm. And they were taking pictures and they were talking and they were all that stuff. So what that led me to conclude was I knew I could pull this off. Mm -hmm. I knew that the way I had to do it was I could only shoot their backs. I couldn't shoot any of the actual performance because Mm -hmm. I'd have talking and flash bulbs and all this stuff going off. Mm -hmm. And I'd have probably an hour to get it done. So that gave me a couple takes. And so I was able to go up there and and shoot that because I had a very clear understanding of, of, of what the location situation would be when I got there. right? Right. So like when you're shooting gorilla, no permits. You just got to have a really great. It's funny. You've got to case the joint. You got to have a great understanding of like what the situation is going into it, especially if you're if you're spending money to do it, meaning you got to rent a camera and you got to do whatever and you're paying actors and you're actually spending money to like get out there. Um, so that's also important. And I think it's it's also in the design of the film, which is which is don't try to do it with scenes that are six pages of dialogue. <laughs> Right. You know, right. you got to go, you got to go back to the, the French new wave. So, so no, so yeah, no, no Sorkin, no Sorkin walk and talk. No, so, no Sorkin walk and talk unless <laughs> you're going to do long lens, you know, when and you're in a car, uh-huh. you know, trying to like shoot out onto the square and, and, and across the street, what you get yeah, yeah. across the street. Right. Um, no, you need to, you need to, you know, plan the scene so that you're not having to do takes. You're not having to do performance like the chase scene that we did. I, I never went back and shot the same area twice. Like mm-hmm. I'd get one shot of this section, one shot of this section, one shot of this section, and we just kept moving, mm-hmm. you know, just kept moving through it. And I knew I would cut it up, you know, and I knew at the, at the least I had a quick little sequence, you know, that I could cut. I had something that I could cut up. Mm-hmm. Um, same with layover in the club. You know, we went into a club scene where we had permission to be in the club, but we had no permission to turn music off. We had no permission to <laughs> change the lights. We didn't have permission to do anything. So I knew that would that would be the case, so I wrote a scene that didn't require performance and didn't require takes. Um, so reserve those things, those scenes, you know, the scenes where you're doing public stuff. Try and just limit what you have to accomplish, and then really know how you're going to accomplish it in a way that's not going to require you to do tons of coverage, multiple takes, those things that are continued continuing to draw your draw attention to um, your scene. Also, another tip is don't have that like non-permitted location be the only possible place that you can shoot that scene. Right. Right. So like in, in layover like, or in negative, we have the parking garage, you know, which they mm-hmm. go to, to get the car. Mm-hmm. Well, I really love that parking garage because of the view of downtown LA and really wanted to use that one, but it could have been any parking garage. Sure. Right? So no, so no it's shootouts. Like, so no shootouts at union station. Exactly. No shootouts at Union Station. Do not have your characters even carry fake weapons. At of Union course. Station. Are you kidding me? Um, you know, but the funny part is so like for, you know, and then you and then you got to kind of this is actually well, I'll get into this after I finish the tips. But mm-hmm. basically, it's like, you know, just don't don't have the location, the, the physical location, meaning like the specific location be dependent, be the only place to shoot that, mm-hmm. you know, have options, because if you get kicked out of one, you don't want your entire movie your entire scene dependent on, on it being that specific place. Right. You know, so it's, to me, the biggest secret to like non-permitted guerrilla shooting, it's all in the design of your script and your story, you know, it has very little to do with like production. I mean, cause you're just taking a camera out and hoping you get what you get, but you need to be in a position where you can shoot a scene that is just getting what you get. And that comes from how do you design the script? to right. be able to take advantage of that stuff. Yeah, it's the mariachi style of doing things. Like, you know, what, what yeah. you have access to or what do you know you can control and ride right. around it. Right, exactly. Like the car, for example, in, in our film, like, you know, it, it's a Volvo station wagon. Why mm-hmm. is it a Volvo station wagon? Because I own a Volvo station wagon. 
<laughs> you know, like that's why it was. And I was just like, oh, well, Katya is like Swedish. She'll be a fun nod to that. And, like, <laughs> it, it just feels like an odd choice. And I'm going to go with it because it'll play in the movie as like an odd choice. It's just kind of funny, you know, that it's like a, a very specific car, um, you know, but it's one of those things where it's like it's certainly using what you have, because if you own the camera, if you own the car, if you own the actor, so to speak, like mm-hmm. you can go shoot whenever you want. We did we did car scenes just on a whim. You know, we'd be like, hey, what are you guys doing Thursday? You want to go up and get this, you know, scene 18? It's a car scene. They're like, yeah, sure. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, and that's what allowed us to really go out and get that stuff without feeling constrained by schedule. Right. You know, and then and then we owned the drone. Like part of our budget was we just bought an Inspire One drone and that gave us the freedom to take that out and shoot whenever we needed to go yeah, shoot. The, it. the drone shots really add a tremendous amount of production value. Thank you. Yeah, that was I mean that again, key, right? Like your big helicopter shots. Mm-hmm. With these drones now, you can really take advantage of it. And it's it's just being really the, smart with how you use it. And the quality of the image was really good. Yeah, it's great. I mean, and it was the standard, you know, a couple of them, we ended up having that micro four thirds camera because Santiago Salviche, who plays one of the hitmen in mm-hmm. the movie, mm-hmm. um, he's also a filmmaker in his own right. And mm-hmm. he has a whole production company and he's like a, he's like an actually drone pilot. So mm-hmm. he did, he did a number of the shots in there in the film. And then I also did some of my own with the, with their own drone. So the, it seems that the the key to this is not to be afraid of dogma and not to be afraid of, 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 just trying to break the mold because people are so caught up with the way they teach things in film school that you have to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. And I, re- I remember when I told people that I was going to do uh, my movie, the, people in the industry, they just look at you like, what? <laughs> like, right. They, they, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you get that dog in headlights or that deer in headlights look all the time. It's like, what? You did, like, well, they didn't get it. Well, it's funny because like I've had meetings where people have seen negative and then they go, we, you know, really, you know, we'd love to do something like negative, but like, you know, obviously we have like protocols and, you know, stuff that we, we can't just like go do it the way you did it. I'm like, Why? get the permits. Like, I don't care. Like, if you guys need to protect yourselves, get the permits. I didn't get permits because I didn't have the money. Right. You know what I mean? Like pay for permits. Like I have no problem with that. Like get location agreements, do it all legal. I have no problem. Yeah, with you're not that. against where, doing it like that. Right, you that's just don't where your money. budget's going to go. You know what I'm trying to find out, figure out in my own head as I, because the other thing too, right? Like is how do you scale up this model? And it's not necessarily possible, you know, to suddenly shoot for six months on and off. Although that's pretty much like what mission impossible does. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's that kind of thing where, how do you scale it up? And what I'm less looking at, I'm looking at more is how do I bring this style and this approach to scenes where I do have closed sets, scenes where I do have extras walking around, scenes where I do have control, mm-hmm. and yet create a feeling of not having had control because that really speaks to me mm-hmm. um, in a unique way. But it also puts me in a position where I can always go and make a movie if I can get $100,000 together. Right. Or if you, you know, if- and that, that's what I've always wanted to protect. I never wanted to be really beholden to anybody else in order to go make a film, mm-hmm. you know, because that's your key. That's how you get, that's how you move forward. You're always waiting on somebody else and you're always in a position. You're never in a position of power. Now when, um, you, okay. So anyway, yeah. no, no. So like, so after layover, you know, you've got your agents at CAA, uh, and you, you got a couple other jobs. How are you, you know, how, can you just kind of walk through the kind of blueprint of how your career has progressed from making a six thousand dollar movie up into where you are right now, just so people understand, listening, they're like, "This is, you know, it's not going to be for everybody, but at least people could get an idea of like where you could go by just getting out and doing something." <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's been a challenging path because I made Layover, mm-hmm. and a lot of goodwill came out of Layover, and I got a lot of meetings and a lot of, uh, you know, again, like. Negative came out of layover. The person, the exec at, at Mar Vista had seen layover and wanted to make something with me, you mm-hmm. know, but it took, took two years before I had that project. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, then I got, I got hired to do this here series for South Beach, a series called South Beach on Hulu, mm-hmm. which was like, again, like million dollar budget, you know, like I spent seven months in Miami, you know, I got paid like way more than the entire budget of layover, you know, to <laughs> like go and direct this thing. And it was, um, you know, I put a lot into it and I, I, I certainly made some mistakes 
from my point of view in terms of some choices I made. Mm-hmm. Um, stylistically that I feel I, it would have let me, it would have made me feel better about the outcome of the project. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I put my heart and soul into it and put a lot of work into it. And I, I sort of, in the same time saw sort of the limitations of, of the approach that we were taking. Um, not having control over the writing, not being a producer on it, not having, you know, a sort of a say in how the money gets right. spent. You're a hired hand. Um, a hired hand, right. total hired hand, but it's a job. And I went into it going great. Like it's going to be on a, it's going to be on a major digital network. You know, it's going to have promotion behind it. Like it's going to get out there. This is exciting. This is cool. Mm-hmm. And then it gets finished and comes out and, you know, there's a regime change at Hulu. So they're not paying, they're, they don't care about your project anymore. They're yep. not promoting it. Mm-hmm. The guy that, you know, fun sort of produced it at Dolphin Entertainment, like he's already made his money. So he doesn't want to put more money into it to like promote it. Mm-hmm. And it basically dies. I mean, literally, it's like a black hole. I mean, nobody has heard of this show. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, you know, for me, a bit of a blessing in disguise because I'm not really happy with my own work on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a, in a, in a way, weird way, I've been able to fail without it having any kind of like impact, impact on me. Right. Um, but it was really disappointing to sort of see it, see nothing come of it and feel like I was no further along in my career than I was before I had made it. Except I had a little bit of money in my pocket, which didn't feel worth it. Um, which is easy to say when you have a little bit of money in your pocket, but like from an artistic point of view, it was it was a bit soul crushing, and it really it ended up sending me on a journey of, of introspection and, and meditation mm-hmm. on my career and what I wanted to be doing, and, mm-hmm. and you know what does success mean to me, um, you know, and and I basically then the following later that year that was. June 20, 2015, when it came out. Later that year, I got hired to do another sort of digital film called Be Somebody, which would be my second feature. And again, a job, you know, um, and uh, took it because I, you know, to be frank, I needed money. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, did the best I could with it. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not phoning these in. I'm really trying to give myself to them and spend a lot of time rewriting it. But again, it did just. Even though it got released by Paramount, it was one of those movies creatively where I feel like it was not set up for success. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, it just wasn't online. In line, it was more about getting it done. Mm-hmm. You know, I had 12 days to shoot the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, working with severe limitations and kind of started to really go like, is this what I want to be doing? Is this is, what's the point of this? Mm-hmm. You know, like these things where you're just churning it out and there's no real artistic nature behind it. And, there's they're not well not that they didn't want that but they weren't willing to provide the resources and the time to really do it mm-hmm. you know and um and and then you know and that really led me to doing negative and negative now you know it's interesting i finished negative last year in june and so it's been now more than a year waiting for it to come out it still hasn't come um, out um still hasn't come out it comes out september 19th okay so it gets released on digital hd and on demand and Mm-hmm. The whole digital package. Netflix will come later. But okay. um, yeah, it's available September 19th. So it's finally out. Mm-hmm. So my hope is, what does this turn into? But a lot of last year has been, you know, um, sort of development on some digital series, you know, working with CAA to sort of figure out the next feature, figure out the next thing. Me writing, I wrote a feature that we've taken out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm adapting a new, I'm adapting a graphic novel now. Um, you know, and a lot of it has been me sort of stepping back from the sort of, um, self-imposed pressure to produce, Mm -hmm. um, that I felt over the last couple of years. I'm a guy who loves being on set. Mm -hmm. I love shooting Mm -hmm. and I feel when I'm not shooting that I'm not doing anything (laughs) and I get itchy and I get unhappy and I get frustrated and I just want to go, go, go. And I think that that leads me to places of, of, of working on things that aren't quite ready to be go, go, go. Got it. You know, it's a quality issue now for me. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to really do is now step back, find other sources of, of income. So I'm not beholden to just taking jobs to take them because Mm -hmm. I need the cash Mm -hmm. and really thinking and working hard on those projects that I really want to be doing. Like, what are those things that, um, really speak to me? Right. And maybe it means taking more time and taking more, you know, and slowing things down and really finding those, those projects and those stories that I want to tell 
And meanwhile, by removing the income question, I don't feel pressured to just take whatever comes at me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because I think I've done that twice now and it feels like it's not panning out the way that it should have, right? Like you kind of go, okay, I'll take this for the money, but it's going to launch me. Oh you God, I, I mean, made that I mean, mistake too many times. Yeah. I mean, and in theory, like be somebody got me my agents at CAA. So like mm -hmm. that, something did come of that. And I got to say, you know, my movie was released by Paramount. Yeah. But it was a movie designed for a very specific audience of like, you know, teen girls. Sure. And they they love it. But it's not something where I'm like spreading, you know, sharing that around going like, let me make your next thriller. <laughs> right. Um, it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's outside so the brand. Was all, yeah, so negative was also a course correct. Negative was me going, okay, I made Layover, which is not a thriller. I made South Beach, which has thriller elements. It's not a thriller. I made mm -hmm. Be Somebody, not a thriller. Yeah. I want to be making thrillers and action movies and mm -hmm. like, you know, dramas. And so, you know, negative was a course correct in that way too. Again, stepping down the ladder in order to make the thing that I really want to make because nobody else is offering up that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And sort of proving that I could do action, that I could do fight scenes, that I could do you know, things like that, that I hadn't really done before. Um, and not only that, but do it for a buck. And so now, you know, so it's, so layover making these movies has led to other things. And, and I can't say that it works again. The path isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is something where the fact is that with this industry, um, it's about what are you producing? It's always right. about what are you producing? What's your, what's your output? Mm -hmm. And you just got to keep doing it. And I think the best thing to be doing is to remove the pressure of Hollywood to begin with. You know, don't mm -hmm. worry about Hollywood. Don't yep. worry about all that stuff. Just be making it. You know, and see, it's easy to say that when you're not working five nine to five and you're not struggling and you're not trying to get your career going. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been there, certainly. So I totally mm -hmm. understand it. In fact, I'm not that far away from it. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> you know, you're just not going to you're you got to really take the time to think about the quality of the stuff you're doing and are you doing something that's really going to stand out there's so much content being made nowadays that you really it's really hard to be in the middle mm -hmm. you know and um yeah so that's uh, kind of a long dive on that <laughs> not a problem at all now uh i'm going to ask you a few more questions uh, a couple of these i asked you last time so i'm going to a couple new ones for you um what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today now that you've moved along another year or so since last we spoke it might be the same thing I said last time. I don't remember, but I, I think like you got to make a feature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, th I, I just think that unless, listen, you can go away and make those like five minute proof of concept shorts, uh -huh. We've but done that. very rarely are you getting to then make the feature, mm -hmm. right? Like how mm -hmm. many of those have come out? How many of those have gotten guys? Lotter how lottery ticket, that? lottery ticket. It's a lot. It's a lottery ticket. Like you are far better off putting your time and energy into a feature, even if it's a low budget one, then you are making shorts or anything like that. Now don't make a feature if you're not ready, right? Like have the experience, make some shorts, get that, get your feet wet, like mm -hmm. have an understanding of like how not to cross the line, like the <laughs> basics of it. Right. But you're really, really making that first feature, even if it's a low budget one, even if it's made for $6,000, it's going to put you into that club that, you know, is somewhat exclusive of somebody that's made a feature film. And if it's, if it's somewhat good, then somebody might ask you to make another one, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't be waiting on that. You should make a feature. You should be thinking about how to make another one, how to make another one, how to make another one, how to make another one for 10 grand, how to make another one for 20 grand, how to make another one for 50 grand. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's keep producing, you know, and if it's not that, then be putting stuff up on YouTube. Right. You know, just keep keep making things. And um, but I think that I made what I thought some, were some really good shorts and really some high value, you know, high production value shorts. And they didn't get me anything like Layover got me. Right. You know, and Layover um, was not an action movie by the, by any stretch. Not an either. action movie. It's not even in English. <laughs> right. You, you really, know, you really went against the grain of that one, <laughs> but it yeah. worked for you. Um. The other thing I would say is that I think you got to – whatever you make, it's got to stand out. It's got to be almost so batshit crazy that people can't not watch it. No, I, I, you, man, you, you're preaching to the choir, man. I completely and totally agree with you. It's, it's so difficult for anyone to get anyone's attention nowadays. 
Uh, yeah. You know, because you can't compete with Hollywood. You're not going to have a $150 million P&A budget to get your movie yeah. out there. So you've got to do something different. And that I takes mean, balls. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's funny because when I had talks with Layover, mm-hmm. or sorry, talks with Mar Vista, uh, sort of about the promotion of the film, I was like, listen, like, have you guys sold it all? Like, have you sold it to everywhere you can sell it? And they were like, well, why? And I'm like, well, I kind of think we need to be able to talk about the budget. Because, you know, originally it's like the whole idea of like, if you haven't sold your movie, you don't really want to talk about the budget because mm-hmm. you don't want somebody to undercut, you know, come in and go, oh, you made it for a hundred grand. Great. We'll give you 50. Right. You know, right, like, right. cause you're underselling yourself. If they assume you made it for a million, then they're, you know, even though you made it for a hundred thousand, then mm-hmm. they might give you a hot 500,000 that you made mm-hmm. it for a hundred thousand dollars mm-hmm. profit. Mm-hmm. So I was like, how, can we sort of talk about this? Because I think the movie changes for people when they know how much was spent. Sure. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to undercut the movie, but I, you know, I think if you assume it's a $2 million movie, mm-hmm. you're kind of like, oh, all right, I guess, you know what I mean? Right. Like you've seen it. Like, mm-hmm. but I think if you know it was made for say under five or you know that the budget was a hundred thousand dollars, like it changes your perception of that film. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important, you know, for me, for people understanding it, because I want, I want people to be able to watch it, not only just to enjoy it. And mm-hmm. I, hopefully I made a great movie. Um, but at the same time, I also want it to be a bit of a like lesson for people to be able to watch it and say, okay, that's what a hundred thousand dollar movie could look like. Right. Yeah, right. That's a good, a very good point. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Ooh. Um, let's see. Well, okay. I'll give you the career one. Mm-hmm. So, I read a book called – I might have already said this. I'm trying to remember. I read a book called The Obstacle is the Way mm-hmm. by Ryan Holiday. Mm-hmm. And it, it really delves into sort of the principles of Stoic philosophy. Yep. And um, – which has been over the last couple of years, basically pretty much since after South Beach came out and died mm-hmm. on the vine, um, has been a, a, a very serious pursuit of mine in terms of like coming to understand a different way of looking at the world, different way of looking at success – and the, the basic tenet of, you know, what is up to us and what is not up to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's radically transformed sort of my mindset and my perception of, of Hollywood and my own work and where I'm putting my time and, and how I'm valuing myself versus others and how I'm defining success. Um, that it's really sort of opened up a whole other world for, um, you know, in terms of my, my approach to my career. Um, that has also made me much more relaxed about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it takes time to get that. Re- it takes time to get relaxed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> frankly, anything by Ryan holiday is fantastic. He wrote a great new book that just came out called perennial seller, which is about why do you, why does a movie like Shawshank redemption stick around, you know, 25 years later after it was made versus mm-hmm. other things that just go kind of show up and go away. And, and um, he's got another book called Ego is the End. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his writing to begin with, but like mm-hmm. that book, The Obstacle is the Way, kind of really transformed, um, you know, sort of my approach to my career. Yeah, uh, Tim Ferriss. You know, I'm assuming you know who Tim Ferriss is. Yep. Yeah, yeah he's big. Vi- fan. big yeah, he's a uh, he's very big into Stoic philosophy. Yeah. Yep. He is, and uh, and is uh, knows Ryan really well. Like Ryan's always on his podcast and talking talking about stuff with them. It was called Obstacles on the Way. The obstacle is the, the way. The the obstacle is the way. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> it is. It is, and it's um, it's it's just a great sort of starter for for anybody looking to get into sort of the principles of Stoic philosophy and and um, how it can sort of relate. You know, because I think Stoic Stoicism has a, a sort of bad connotation, mm-hmm, but it's mm-hmm. not it's not that at all, and it's a really unique way of sort of like. Again, like going back to Hollywood, like you're in L.A., you're like surrounded by billboards of people's movies and, Mm -hmm. you know, friends that are having success and you're having all this stuff. And frankly, all that's out of your control. And if you're going to focus on all the things out of your control, you're just going to drive yourself nuts. Mm -hmm. Which most people do. (laughs) Most people do. And frankly, I did, too. You know, I mean, it's 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 a very hard thing to fight against when you're you're constantly surrounded by, it. you know, like and um, so it's been a really sort of philosophical change in in who i am and led to me making some big changes in my life like moving away from la and Mm -hmm. moving to some property in new york state and sort of having a much more calming presence and you know just focusing on my career in a different way and do you do you would you agree in the statement that generally speaking when you are the most afraid of doing something it's the it's the direction you should be going 
Oh yeah. I mean, it's because, but less so like, it's a great marker. It's a great marker because I know it's going to be a challenge. Right. That's what it is. Right. Like I know that it, I knew late, I knew negative was going to be a challenge, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, there's other things where I'm like, this is going to be easy. Like I'll just show up and it'll be easy. Um, that's what I'm always looking for as a challenge because uh, that's where you get your best ideas. That's where you're focused so intently on it that, you know, you're so zoned into it mm-hmm. that um, that's where you get your best stuff. So, you know, absolutely. I think that if, if, if it scares you, that means it's going to be challenging, which means it's going to be good for you. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Absolutely. Now, where can people find you online? So the best thing is Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, my my handle is uh, at Joshua underscore Caldwell, C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. Mm-hmm. Um, you can branch out from there and uh, find all my other places. Um, and uh, yeah, and the negative is, like I said, it's being released on digital HD, iTunes, Amazon, all that stuff, um, and all on-demand uh, networks on mm-hmm. September 19th. Man, thank you so much for coming back on the show, man. You're one of the rare uh, guests that I've invited back. There's only been a ah, hand, appreciate that. Only, I, love it. I think only two or three out of 181 podcasts so far. You, you know, know why? Because all your guests go from like the indie mentality, and they all become huge, big guys and right. unreachable. Exa- exactly. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not there yet. <laughs> or they're or they're huge, big guys to begin with. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. No, but uh, I, I appreciate no, you coming. I, mean, back. I love. I, I love talking shop, so it's always a pleasure to come on with somebody that that gets that uh, approach and that mentality. Thank you again, Jeff, so much for being on the show. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. As promised, that was a fairly epic podcast uh, and an episode. And I want to thank Joshua again for being on the uh, the show and explaining how you you know don't forget your roots of where you're coming from. Even though you might have a bigger budget, doesn't mean you have to think like a bigger budget film because you will get more out of not thinking that way. So if you take a $6,000 film mentality and put it into a $100,000 budget, you're able to get a spy thriller action movie that looks insane and has high production value because you're able to go out and do things that you just wouldn't be able to do if you went down the mentality of trying to make a half a million dollar movie for a hundred thousand dollars, you know the film Swingers, which is a very famous independent film uh, starring John Favre and directed by Doug, Doug Lehman, is a, a perfect example. They had, I think, a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars, and they said, "Why are we going to try to make a movie that we have a budget of a hundred, hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars to make a movie, and we're going to try to make a million dollar movie uh, with that budget and make it look like a million dollar movie? Why don't we take that hundred fifty thousand dollars and make it?" look and try to make a $25,000 movie look insane and go down as opposed to trying to go up and you'll be able to get more out of it. And that's what they did. And it was, you know, it did fairly well uh, in its day as well. So just go down this mentality, guys. I think it'll be very, very helpful to you in your filmmaking journey. Now, this is episode 199 and next episode is number 200, which is going to be a special episode. I'm going to be giving you a little teaser about that episode is how you can sell your movie using Facebook ads. We're going to talk to a Facebook ninja and we're going to go deep down the rabbit hole on how filmmakers can use Facebook to market their films, themselves, their projects, and how to do it affordably and how to do it right and and, and how to use the most powerful marketing tool on the planet. That is going to be the big episode 200 because I wanted to do something really cool and exciting for you guys and something I know people will go back to and check out episode 200. And this was, uh, I just felt so important that filmmakers understand this process and learn what Facebook and, and what marketing they can do on social media to help to get their message out. So Stay tuned for that. It should be coming out this week. I'm working on them as we speak. And if you want links to anything we spoke about in this episode, just head over to our show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 199. And guys, if you have not had a chance to go and leave a review for the show on iTunes, please take two minutes, go to iTunes and leave us a good review. It really helps us in 
the rankings, getting more people to listen to us, and 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 getting the message out on what we're trying to do at Indie Film Hustle and the movement that I'm trying to create and the tribe is helping us create. So just head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us a good review. It means so, so much to me, man. I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for listening. I hope this episode was of value to you. And as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you in episode 200. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 